We're moving into chapters 15 and 16 of Genesis in our study on Abraham. I'm Pastor David, and let me set this up by skipping ahead a little bit just at the beginning to Genesis chapter 22. This is the key chapter that we're building towards. Uh, this is where God is going to call on Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And I think uh, how chapter 22 begins tells us what's going on in chapters 15 all the way through 21. Listen to what it says. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Now here's the interesting question. Why does God describe Isaac with so many different terms? He says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Why not just say, take, take Isaac or take your son? Well, because that's what chapters 15 through 21 are going to be developing. In fact, I would say that this verse in the beginning of chapter 22 is recapping these chapters. Abraham has no idea who his descendant is going to be, how God is going to fulfill his promises. Abraham has gotten great promises that God is going to make a great nation out of him, but the details are very fuzzy. And the details will get filled in a little bit chapter by chapter. Where we encounter Abraham in Genesis 15, Abraham knows that a great nation is going to come from him, but, but where? Abraham has no biological descendants. And so Abraham assumes that it is going to be his servant uh, who is going to inherit everything he has. Uh, and that's going to change to a actual biological child of Abraham through another woman. And then that will change to, no, through your wife, Sarah. Uh, and so we're going to get more and more specific about the kind of child God is going to give Abraham that he's going to build a nation from. It's your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And that whole progression uh, we're going to see in these next uh, number of chapters as we prepare for Genesis chapter 22. For us as believers in Jesus Christ, I think we need to recognize first Abraham's great faith. He had so few details. He didn't even know coming into Genesis 15 he was going to have a biological son. He just knew God promised a great nation was going to come from him. And he responded in faith. Now we not only know exactly how God is going to create this great nation, but we know specifically the name of the Savior, the Messiah, that will come from this nation, that he would die on the cross, that he would rise from the dead, that he is going to defeat death, that he is coming again. We have so much more detail added to the promises of God, and yet we need to respond the way Abraham did. We don't yet see face to face. We don't yet have every detail filled in. We still wait from afar uh, for the final hope of salvation to come when Jesus descends, when the trumpet sounds. And, and so in some ways we find ourselves in a similar situation as Abraham. And just as the scripture promises that uh, what no eye has seen or, or no, no ear has heard, uh, what God has prepared for those who love him, the promises are going to far exceed what we can even expect right now. So for Abraham, we see that play out, that as God develops the promise and begins to fulfill the promise, uh, it exceeds Abraham's expectations. So let's begin looking at Genesis chapter 15. It says, after this, this is what we looked at last week, after Abraham uh, rescued Lot and uh, Melchizedek the priest appeared, uh, that's what we've, where we finished last week, if you want to go back and look at that. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So his name is still Abram at this point. And notice that it is the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So this is the word coming in a visible form to Abram. That's what the text says. This is uh, a further development or reason to believe that when Genesis 1 says, and God said, let there be light, that that was the word that was there at creation through him 
all things were made. This is what John says in John chapter 1. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. This is the word. This is God the Son that is appearing to Abram in a vision. And he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. So God appears and gives another promise. Do not be afraid. Uh, Abram had just had to face uh, in a military battle these people who had captured his nephew Lot. And you could imagine that Abram might have reason to be afraid that all of these powers around him uh, could come and attack him and, and he doesn't have this large army and, and he doesn't know if he's safe. And so God says, I am your shield. And this is a great promise, but Abram is honest with God. He says, okay, but how are you going to fulfill all these promises? I don't have a child yet. Verse four says, then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son. And that's where we get that first line in Genesis 22, take your son. Uh, your, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Abraham, you are going to have a biological descendant. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So you're going to have many descendants. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. That is a very significant verse. Paul is going to talk about this in Galatians. Uh, he also talks about it in Romans. Paul says, do we nullify the word by this gospel? No, rather we establish the law or the Torah in Romans 3, 31. In other words, Paul uh, in his letters is going to write that this salvation he preaches that is through grace, that is through faith, that is in Christ, is not something unheard of in the Old Testament or something new, but is exactly what the Old Testament has always taught. Abraham believed the promises of God and it was credited to him. It was grace. It was given to him uh, a righteousness. And for Paul, it was very important that he not teach anything that he couldn't find uh, a confirmation of in the Old Testament. And so this verse became very important for, for Paul that Abram believed in the Lord and the promises and he received righteousness. We too believe in the Lord. We trust that Jesus Christ really has made payment for our sins in his death and resurrection and God credits it to us as righteousness. We, we don't earn it, but that faith is credited to us as a righteousness that, that saves, that ultimately justifies us. And so Abram is the first to have this kind of statement made, and therefore he is the father of all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. Paul is going to make a significant uh, issue of this in Galatians. He asks, when did Abram get this credit of righteousness? Was it after he was circumcised? In other words, after he became uh, a Jew, in a, in a sense, after he received the law of circumcision. No, it was before. Abraham isn't going to be circumcised until chapter 17. And so this is why Paul says Abraham is the father of us all, meaning Jew and Gentile alike. We're all saved through faith, the kind of faith Abraham had, whether we are uh, Jew or Gentile. Because Abraham had a saving faith both as a Jew and as a Gentile in a sense, because the law of circumcision has not yet come. Um, and so we'll go on. It says in verse 7, He also said to him, God or God the Son, the Word, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Once again, Abram asks an honest question. God says, I'm going to do this. And Abram says, how can I know? And we have to sympathize with Abram in a sense because he does not have the scriptures. He does not know of Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. He does not have the kind of witnesses that we have to the truth of God's promises. 
He's only received certain promises. There's no track record for him to know about the faithfulness of God. And so he honestly asks this question, God, I want to follow you. I want to believe. Give me some basis of which I can trust you. And I think part of this interaction is why we, we speak of Abraham as being a friend of God. Uh, God answers his questions. God does not rebuke him for having honest questions. We too can ask honest questions. And we should ask questions if we have questions. The difference between you and I and Abraham is that uh, those questions are already out there, have been answered. They're there for us to look at and examine. Uh, namely, that, that we know that Jesus Christ has gone to the cross, demonstrating God's love for us. We know that all these promises God made to Abraham about having many descendants and giving this land have been fulfilled. The Israelites still live in the land of Israel to this day against all odds. Uh, it, it is a true miracle uh, of the course of history that this tiny group of people surrounded by one world power after another that has come and gone are still there. Um, and so we have the scriptures, we have the scriptures validated by history, uh, and what we know to be true, uh, to speak to us and to confirm to us that God's promise to us in Jesus Christ uh, is true and we can trust it. Uh, but Abraham doesn't have that at this point. So he asks about it. And the Lord said to him in verse 9, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arrange the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. All right, we have an odd description here, right? We have Abram cutting animals in half and laying them on the ground. We have birds uh, of prey trying to come down and eat the animals and, and Abram we uh, have to picture according to the text seeking um, to drive them away and this is very odd to us what's going on well what's going on is Abram is first making a covenant this was how this God Abram is encountering is going to make a, a solemn covenant um, by passing between the parts of this uh, of these animal pieces that would be bizarre to us, but this is kind of like signing a contract in an ancient culture. And uh, the cutting of the animals and going between them signifies that uh, it's sort of like, may this be done to whoever of us does not honor the agreement or the covenant. And notice that this is not something Abraham is committing to do something. This is God making a promise. God is going to come and pass between these animal parts to make his solemn promise to Abraham of what he is going to do. Uh, we also have birds of prey descending, trying to disrupt this event, trying to um, in interfere and carry off the carcasses, and Abraham chasing them away, which Jewish interpretation understands to be a foreshadowing of Abraham, or the faith of Abraham, shielding uh, the Israelites from the curses of the Torah. Uh, and many of the prayers, the Jewish prayers, reference Abraham and the favor God had on Abraham. In fact, Moses begins this tradition of appealing to God on the basis of Abraham's reward, his righteousness, God's promise to be the shield of Abraham. Um, and uh, so one of the curses in the Torah is that if the Israelites are faithless to following the commands, that they will go into exile that they will be conquered for a time, not entirely. God promises that he will always restore them and bring them back. But there will be death. There will be armies that come. There will be destruction. There will be going into exile when the Israelites are faithless to God's covenant. And one of the specific curses is that uh, the birds of the air will be thick in the sky because of all the death that will occur. And so here we have Abraham already acting out, looking out for the covenant, looking out for his descendants, uh, in a sense, acting out, scaring away these birds. Um, and uh, this event in, in Jewish tradition is associated with Passover. In other words, they believe that this evening occurred on the very same day as Passover, uh, even though the actual Passover doesn't occur for hundreds of years into the future. But 
the same date on the Jewish calendar would be the date that this covenant is made between God and Abraham. And it's, it's fitting that this would happen because listen to what happens next. Verse 12 says, As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. So God is telling Abraham about a future exodus, that the Israelites, his descendants, will be slaves in Egypt, that he will bring them out. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. So all of the slavery and everything will happen later on. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. This smoking fire pot uh, and this blazing torch represent the very presence of God. And it is indeed later at the Exodus that God will lead the Israelites out um, in a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. Notice also this event begins with a dreadful darkness coming over Abraham. The ninth plague is darkness on the land of Egypt. And then the tenth plague is that the angel of death comes and strikes the firstborn. And here we have uh, this very visible symbol coming and passing between the dead animal parts um, in a similar uh, fashion to how God will appear to the Israelites following the Exodus. God at that time will part the Red Sea for the Israelites to pass through the water. Um, so there are, is a lot of imagery here connecting what God is doing this night uh, with Passover. And so it makes sense to think that this did happen uh, on the very day of Passover as a, as a prophecy of what would happen in the future. And then it says in verse 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant. And this phrase, on that day, refers to, uh, can, could be translated even to refer to a feast day or, or a day as Passover is called, uh, a special time for the Lord. Um, that's going to come up again later in Genesis, we'll see, be a significant phrase. The Lord made a covenant with Abram, Abram on that day and said to your descendants, I will give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And this is the first time this uh, designation of where the borders of Israel, Abraham's coming na nation, would be. So we begin to see God developing the promise, adding a lot of detail, even talking about hundreds of years into the future, what's going to happen. And, and so God has had a plan in place for what he's doing with Abraham all along. Abraham is learning about parts of it when it is time for him to learn. As he has questions, I don't understand how is this going to happen, God answers. And again, today we have so much more detail even than Abraham had. Chapter 16 develops the story further. It's the story of Hagar and Ishmael. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Now this is going to lead to problems in the next several chapters. Problems between Sarai and her maidservant Hagar. Problems between this child of Abraham and uh, Hagar and the future child of Abraham and Sarai. And uh, these problems we'll, we'll read about in the coming chapters tell us that what Abraham and Sarah did here is not exactly what they were supposed to do. Um, that something about how they responded uh, is going to create problems down the road. But we can sympathize with how they respond. God told Abraham that it's going to be that you're going to have a son that I'm going to fulfill these promises through. God did not say that the son would be between Abraham and Sarah. And so Abraham and Sarah are saying, okay, God's going to give you, Abraham, a biological son, but I'm too old to have children, so we need to help God out here to accomplish this. Let, let's 
have this kind of arrangement. Uh, and this could happen in ancient cultures. It was sort of a surrogate motherhood. They didn't have the, the biological technology to do it any other way. So uh, Sarah gives her maidservant Hagar to Abraham to produce a, a physical offspring to be the heir of the household, to, again, sort of help God out fulfill the promises. And in their mind, they're like, well, God can't make a child between you, Abraham, and me, Sarah. I'm much too old. And this is going to add to this story of how God is going to eventually come to Abraham and say, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, not Ishmael. Uh, he is the one I'm going to call on you to take to sacrifice. Uh, so we're, we'll talk more about Hagar and Ishmael and uh, the role they play in the story uh, in the coming weeks as we make way uh, for what God is going to ask Abraham to do in Genesis chapter 22.